talk about anything that you've spoken about so far. I'm here to talk about the Olympics and swimming. And most importantly, I'm here to talk about my journey. And I could tell you about my journey in the sense of all of the swimming pools I've been to all over the world and all of the chlorine I've smelled in my lifetime. <laughs> uh, but I prefer to tell you about the journey that I took starting when I was about three years old, ending when I was about 24, and where I started in that journey, which was as a winner, and where I wound up, which was as a champion. And that was a journey I, I took with amazing coaches, with my amazing family, with amazing teammates. And it's a journey where I learned a lot about myself, a lot about the sport of swimming, and a lot about life. What I learned is that it's important to be a champion. It's important to do your best at all times under any given circumstances. Now, some of you out there might be saying, well, Janet, being a winner and being a champion is very much the same thing. But I really beg to differ. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the difference between being a winner and being a champion. My journey begins in Orange County in Southern California, where I still live. Um, my mother grew up actually here in Texas, um, in Waco, where there's not a river, um, and she was never around any water. My father grew up in Philly, and my dad met her when he was in the Air Force. He's a veterinarian. He was in Waco taking care of some uh, Air Force animals, and met my mother. They moved to Southern California. They bought a home with a swimming pool, and when they moved in, they looked at each other and said, do you know how to swim? And my mom said, I can't swim. And my dad said, well, neither can I. And they looked at their three children, me being the youngest, and my two older brothers, and said, well, what do we do? And so they took us to the YMCA. And at 18 months, I got into the swimming pool, and I never cried. I could swim all four strokes by the time I was three. And by the time I was five, I joined a local swim team, and I was swimming. And I loved to swim. I was really good at it. I didn't really take it very seriously, but I had this burning desire in me to always win. Although I, I really preferred to just be social and hang out with my friends. And my favorite swimming story as a kid was a swim meet called the Pumpkin Invitational. Now my coach from when I was a child until when I went to my first Olympics, until I went to college, was a coach named Bud. Perfect name for a swimming coach, Bud. Coach Bud. All right, so Coach Bud and I were at the Pumpkin Invitational in Southern California. I was seven years old. And if you won a race at the Pumpkin Invitational, you received a free pumpkin. Okay, and so my best stroke was freestyle. My first race was a 25-yard freestyle. I didn't win. My next race was a 25-yard breaststroke. I didn't win. My next race was a 25-yard butterfly. I didn't win. All I wanted was a pumpkin. I had spent the, <laughs> I had spent the entire meet, running around with my girlfriends, having fun, playing games, eating candy bars, and really hadn't focused on winning, even though I thought I could win. And the last event was a 25-yard backstroke. Now, the funny thing about the Pumpkin Invitational is that my father's office was next to a huge field which had pumpkins. It was a pumpkin patch in the fall, and the gentleman that owned the pumpkin patch in the field would give us pumpkins. So my mom came up to me before my last race when I was panicked because I hadn't won a pumpkin yet and said, honey, it's okay. We'll get you a pumpkin from the field next to your dad's office. Backstroke's your worst race. I don't think, I don't know if you're going to win a pumpkin. And I thought, well, I'm going to win a pumpkin. And I walked up to Coach Bud and asked him what I needed to do in my absolute worst race to win a pumpkin. He told me what I needed to do. For the first time in my life, I listened to my coach telling me what I needed to do. <laughs> and I won. I won my pumpkin. It was little, never mind the fact that the one I could have gotten from the patch next door was this big. The one pumpkin I won was this big, but I have never been more proud of a victory in my life. I kept swimming, I kept having a great time, I won a little, I lost a little, I had fun, most importantly. And then something changed. In 1984, when I was 12 years old, the Olympics came to the city of Los Angeles. And my parents, like every parent in Southern California, wanted their kids to go watch the Olympic Games. So they took us to the opening ceremonies, and I watched the athletes march out in their opening ceremony uniforms, behind their country's flags, waving their flags proudly, and I thought, this was incredible. Yes, thank you. The pomp and circumstance of the Olympics, to me, was, was like nothing I'd ever seen. And remember, I was a kid. I was 12. So for me, it was very overwhelming and very exciting. I watched Rafer Johnson, if any of you remember from 1984, run the Olympic torch into the stadium and run up all those big, long stairs and light that Olympic cauldron. And I didn't really know a lot about the Olympics. I didn't know about the pomp and circumstances. But I knew it was something I wanted to be a part of. After the opening ceremonies a few days later, we went to one of the days of the swimming competition. And I watched the athletes, who swam much faster than I did, 
do what I did every day in swim practice, except they won these beautiful gold and silver and bronze medals. And I was overwhelmed with the entire Olympic experience. So I went back to swim practice, and I sat down with Coach Bud. And I said, Bud, I want to go to the Olympics. I, I, I want to go to the Olympics. I want to be an Olympian. I want to go to opening ceremonies. I want to represent the United States of America at the Olympic Games. Can I do it? And Bud kind of sat there and, and in his wise way said, well, Janet, you're 12 years old. You're about to enter high school. What do you want to do when you get to high school? And I said, well, Coach Bud, I want to be a cheerleader. And I want to be in student council. And I want to be in National Honor Society. And I want to meet cute boys. And I want to do everything that a freshman in high school wants to do. And he said, well, I, I don't know if you can do that. And I said, well, why can't I just add being an Olympian onto that little list of things to do? And he said, Janet, because you're, you, you don't really have the capability of focusing. He said, I think that you actually are a very talented athlete. I think you can find this burning desire inside of you. But I'm not really sure that you can always focus on, on what you're doing. And I said, well, I want to focus. What, tell me what I need to do. And he said, well, I'm going to teach you a little bit about instant gratification versus future rewards. And I said, OK, well, tell me a little bit. He said, well, instant gratification, 4.15, the alarm clock goes off. And I said, wait, 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 4.15? Why is the alarm clock going off at 4.15? <laughs> and he said, because you have to be in the water by 4.45. And I went, oh, OK, well, what's the, what's the future reward from that instant gratification? He said, well, instant gratification is turning off the alarm clock, which sounded great to me, and going back to sleep. And your future reward is standing on the starting blocks of the Olympic Games. Instant gratification, not coming to practice every day. Future reward, standing on the starting blocks of the Olympic Games. Instant gratification, uh, maybe being a cheerleader, coming to practice every once in a while. Future reward, standing on the starting blocks of the Olympic Games. Now, I was only 12. This was a lot for a young person to handle. Bud went on to tell me that I would have to come to work out every morning at 4.15. We would swim six miles before uh, school, 4.45 to 7.30. Um, my mom would pick me up and I'd go to school for the whole day and then come back to swim practice from 2 until 6 and swim another 6 miles. Logging about 12 miles in the pool a day, 18,000 meters if that means anything, it's a lot of meters, um, and very much dedicate my life to the sport of swimming. The thing that Bud did for me was he realized my strengths and he realized my weaknesses. He realized that if he explained to me that if I gave 100% I could have everything I wanted, that I would do it. He also realized that he needed to keep me focused. So by telling me about future rewards, by continuing to tell me about what I could do, what experiences I could have, what rewards I could have at the end of the tunnel, if you will, Bud really helped me focus. I went home from that meeting with Bud, and I told my parents, who still don't know how to swim and uh, weren't so thrilled about this, that, hey, Mom and Dad, you're getting up every morning at 4.15 and taking me to practice. <laughs> and then you're taking me back to practice and going all over the world for swim meets, and never once did my parents hesitate. Never once, never once did they say, we don't want to take you, because they also saw the fire in my eyes. And they helped me stay focused as well. Even though they didn't know a thing about swimming, my dad was there every morning shaking me, waking me up, turning the lights on, making the bed over me, doing whatever he had to do to give me a workout. Because everyone had to keep me focused. So for four years, through high school, I went to work out every morning at 4.15. I trained my heart and soul out. I never missed a practice unless I was sick and my mom made me. But I never wanted to miss practice. I got my homework done because I wanted to go to practice. And I never once didn't give 100% when I was at workout. After my sophomore year of high school, in the summer of 1987, I broke my first two world records. And I was primed to go to the 1988 Olympics and make the Olympic team and represent the United States of America. I was about 5'3". And as the commentator said on that video, I really literally had to stuff myself with food to stay above 100 pounds. That was my goal. Because I was swimming so much, I just burned so much energy. And I was very, very small. The Olympics in Seoul were my first real international competition. And I'd never swum against the East Germans. And I'd never really seen the East Germans. We'd all heard about them. But I had never really had a vision of them. I just knew they were big. So I was standing on the swimming pool. I was once again standing on the side, getting ready to do my stretches, getting ready to get in the swimming pool. And Bud had finally showed up in Korea. He was able to come to Korea. He couldn't come on the training with us. But he was in at the Olympics. He was sitting behind me on the pool deck, 
trying to get me focused, trying to get me into the swimming pool. I was ready to go. I was doing a few more arm swings before I got in. And all of a sudden, this woman walked into the lane next to me. And I felt her presence. And I looked over, and I looked up, and I looked down. And she was, I'm not kidding, like 5'11", and about 180 pounds of solid muscle. No joke. And I was 5'3", and weighed 99 pounds. And I looked her up, and I looked her down, and I, I looked at Bud. And I said, well, hey, coach, who is that? And he said, that's an East German. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I said well, do the, coach, I, I, do they all look like this? And he said, no. And I went, oh, thank goodness they don't all look like this. He said, actually, Janet, most of them are bigger than that. And I went, oh my gosh, are you kidding me? And I watched this woman jump into a swimming pool. I took about 40 strokes to get to one, from one end of a Olympic size pool to the other. She crossed this pool like 10 strokes. It was like a cruise liner. It, she made it, it was like, and I was a little white adult, literally. And I just, and I went and I sat back down in the chair next to Bud and I said, Coach, I don't think I can do this. I think I'm just happy with the Olympic title, with the clothes and the trip to Disneyland and the college applications because there is no way I'm going to beat two of these girls in every single race I swam. And Bud said to me, you need to remember what you've done leading up to this. You need to remember all those workouts you went to. You need to remember that that gives you confidence. And then I started thinking about it. I thought about all the times I've gotten up for morning workout. I thought about all the things I've missed in high school. I thought about my parents' sacrifices, my brother's sacrifices. I thought about those 12 miles I swam every single day. And I don't know what they were doing in East Germany during those four years, but I know that I was training my heart and soul out. And with the exception of those two weeks in Hawaii, I was ready to beat those women. And when I stood up on the starting blocks with the women from the Soviet Union and China and East Germany, as you see, I wasn't the biggest and I wasn't the strongest, but I was the woman, I was the athlete that believed in myself the most. And I was able to believe in myself because of all the hard work that I put in prior to those Olympic Games. And that's the reason I won. Most of it was up here. My size didn't matter. I believed in myself, I put in the work, and that's what made me successful.